I am Ann Keen. I am Zoom's Global Education Lead, and you are now about to witness a fantastic panel uh, called uh, Enhancing Student and Faculty Engagement Across the Campus. And with me today, I have some, um, uh, some of my esteemed colleagues and some of our, our great customers. Um, we have Sarah Campbell, who is an instructional designer and training specialist with the School of Pharmacy with the University of Mississippi. And we have Rusty Waterfield, who is the AVP for Information Technology Services at Old Dominion University. Joining me and for my colleagues, we have Tane Barzos, who is the global lead, product lead for Zoom. And we have Colby Nish, who is uh, our um, uh, lead for um, Zoom phones. And then we have Mark um, Barrigan, who is our lead for Zoom rooms. And those of you who may think of Zoom just as meetings, we're much more than meetings. And you're gonna hear how we, um, our, our customers from Old Dominion and also from um, um, University of Mississippi are using uh, Zoom throughout the campus to improve student engagement. So let's get started. Did we lose Sarah? We did, okay. Well, Rusty, I will start with you. How's that? Okay. That's great. Well, Rusty, um, what is the, you know, what's sort of before and after picture, right? With um, now that we've just gone through just, you know, an incredible event um, that has really forced change upon so many all throughout um, the world and especially um, the world of education. Um, so what, um, how has that changed from a student engagement standpoint? Because I know at your school, student engagement is really important. Student success is really important. How has that, has that changed and what are you doing to, to kind of improve the student or make sure that you keep that community and student engagement together? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's been certainly been a challenge as we did a rapid transition to all online in March to prepare for you know, an, an opening in the, in the fall. Um, you know, we, we've been in, um, you know, we've had online programs for 30 plus years at Old Dominion University. We have 100 plus degree programs online. And so we felt like we do a pretty good job in supporting the online student and establishing those virtual environments to keep those students engaged. And so we, we felt like it was embedded into, you know, every area to be able to support that student. But we, we learned something very early on in March, you know, when we saw, you know, just about every campus, you know, begin to uh, develop these virtual hubs for faculty, staff, and students. Some of them are called key teaching, learning online, working remotely that were focused to those populations and how to the access to the various services and support and tools, um, you know, to make that transition you know, successful. So we thought this idea of virtual hubs were, you know, very exciting and, you know, was an opportunity then to really focus, um, you know, student support, student engagement, um, you know, to, uh, the various services on the campus. So we, we transitioned to things like college-based student recruitment, you know, so every college created a virtual hub around college recruitment, links to webinars, information sessions, you know, links to, you know, departments. Um, to then we started to see department-based support services create these virtual environments. So we have an organization we call Student Engagement Enrollment Services known as C's, and then they created virtual C's. So how do I access? So you can go there, career development, financial aid, counseling, you know, Office of Leadership, Student Involvement, uh, Office of Intercultural Relations, Rec and Wellness, focusing on things like community, belonging, leadership and training, well-being. Um, and so, you know, we just, we, we saw how, you know, each of these and then that, um, you know, we're doing this and then it really bled into the academic support service of tutoring course specific health services. And so you saw an interesting use of Zoom through, you know, each of these. So the ability of a student who would typically be on campus, walk into career development, maybe ask a question, schedule a meeting, you know, mm -hmm. now they're using virtual walk-in uh, using Zoom. So you, know, you just join a meeting, you, you know, put in a waiting room, uh, you get joined, you might get put into a breakout room in order to you know, talk with a counselor or schedule a meeting, workshops, to attend workshops, or even things around you know, student activities to support learning. Um, interesting, I've, you know, I've heard of students who actually are joining student or joining Zoom meetings, playing music in the background to study together, right? Not necessarily wow. just interacting, right? But mm -hmm. using a place for which they're engaging, trying to build that, you know, community, right? So, you know, we, we, we know that it's been tough for many students and even those who are on campus, the ability to connect, develop new relationships, 
you know, being vaunted has not, you know, met what they expected, or at least what they had heard what college life, you know, was like. So we want to make it easy to be able to, you know, gain, uh, you know, gain access to those support services. Um, and, I, and I think the other thing that's been kind of interesting as we, you know, are, you know, have a number of campus events. And in fact, I think Hispanic Heritage Month, we had an event yesterday um, where now these events can be much more inclusive. Families, alumni that are not in the area, you know, more faculty staff who are willing to participate because I said, you know, in the evening they can go home or they're home and, you know, not, not have to worry about staying on campus for a long time. So it, it has been, you know, um, you know interesting. Um, and, you know, we, it's a lot of work ahead on how yeah. do you keep students engaged. So um, I'm going to do a thank you. That's, um, it, I think when we think about going back uh, to school or just the whole school, I should say college experience, right, is not just the, the classroom, but it sounds like you've really tried to keep that level of engagement all throughout the, the campus. And the fact that people have just really adapted is, is quite amazing. We hear incredible stories. Um, Mark, I'm going to um, I'll turn it over to you, but before I do, um, I'm going to reach out to our event support and see if our other um, uh, customer is going to be joining us. Chris, is um, Sarah going to be able to get back in or from Old Mississippi? They're working on it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, and just to remind everybody, a little housekeeping, um, we have disabled chat, but you can um, submit questions through the Q&A. So, um, uh, Mark, um, you, um, you know, just heard uh, Rusty talk about uh, the, you know, the different uses throughout all the different departments. Um, what are you seeing from Zoom Rooms? Uh, how um, our customers are using Zoom Rooms and, and some of the, the great technology that we have. How, how would you um, add to yeah. that? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, at the beginning of the school year, before it actually started, July, August timeframe, right, there was this mad rush. You know, tons of people started calling us, tons of educational systems calling us saying, what are we going to do in the classroom? You know, and so we, you know, we we're always asked, well, how do we do it? How do we build it? And there's a thousand different ways you could build a classroom, right? So there was no real right or wrong way of doing it. Um, however, what we started learning a lot during the course of, of the, uh, the month as it went along before the school season started. Um, so a lot of the actual schools started to realize that less is more. Right, and we don't have to get it perfect because we don't know what we don't know. And I think, I think uh, um, from that came, you know, a little bit of panic as to we don't want to mess this up. And and but a, a lot of good came out of that, right? So we did learn that less is more. You don't have to let perfect get in the way of good enough. So we started getting our our hardware partners right into the equation, and they really stepped up to the plate, right? So we have a lot of really good hardware partners. They went into the classrooms, built the, the rooms out for the actual educators and you know I was terrified myself having you know a daughter that's going back to school but you know we're seeing a lot of things like all-in-one whiteboards in classrooms right we're seeing things like um, bars that are hooked up to existing whiteboards and um, with the blended classrooms the we've been receiving nothing but positive feedback everything from instructors going back saying we didn't realize it was going to work this seamlessly right the, we all know that the zoom platform has stepped up and really delivered during this time but I had no idea how the blending of the Zoom platform with the hardware would do it. And uh, we have a lot of case studies. Also, a lot of new features are coming out of this. So please tune in next week to Zoomtopia. We'll have things like um, living whiteboards we're going to be announcing, things where, you know, in the past, you do a whiteboard session, annotations, and it would be just a snapshot. We're going to have things that, um, you know, we've been getting asked from the educational market to make it a lot more interactive and a lot more, if you will, um, things like whiteboards that live on. So a lot of innovation coming that we're doing just, just from this learning process alone. Um, and then, you know, a lot of the, the, even like K through 12, we've been getting instructors calling us back saying, you know, we rely on this technology now. So in the past where you'd have this piece of hardware in the classroom that was just sitting there collecting dust, now we have to use these things, right? So it's, it's like the, the reception has been very, very well received. So I would just say that, you know, um, a lot more to come. And then, and then a lot of the also, um, you know, schools are thinking about post pandemic. So that's another thing that we're, we're learning is that these devices in the classroom, the Zoom rooms, will live on beyond the, the pandemic, which is great. Yeah. 
Thank you. Um, I think uh, certainly at Zoomtopia, we have a lot of announcements, um, especially in the sort of keep everybody safe mode. There's a lot of things that we are um, going to be announcing about how to, how to do that through the use of Zoom rooms and some of our displays. And, and Colby, I know um, uh, a lot of schools are looking at holistically um, at Zoom as their unified communication platform. And so Zoom phone has a lot to offer there, especially with some of the things that we're gonna be announcing next week around E911 and other things. So what, what can you share with us uh, how schools are using Zoom phone across to communicate with uh, students and faculty? Yeah, absolutely, great question. And uh, a lot of exciting announcements will be next week at Zoomtopia if those can come. Uh, but I did wanna talk a little bit about what Rusty said about the students just turning on music and uh, hanging out. And doing that over Zoom, it's just incredible to see those types of use cases. And when you think about, you have a platform that allows you to send quality audio across there, so much so that students enjoy it. It's not like an AM radio anymore. It's amazing high def audio that comes across here on this platform. And that platform that delivers that is the same one that we use for Zoom phone. So same platform, same experience. If you're used to Zoom and you want the ability to add a Zoom phone, a soft phone into there, um, very simple to do. And what we've seen schools do is, you know, when we had to go home and work, I couldn't pick up my desk phone. It was tied to some centric system, an old PBX, didn't really have all the features. And as Mark said, kind of less is more sometimes. I just need to be able to communicate and keep in touch with my students. And so the ability to do things like SMS, have my voicemail, have a really simple way to communicate, but then elevate those into a collaboration experience across Zoom, we've seen great use cases there. The other one is around security that you mentioned. And uh, we have a great university presenting with us next week uh, that really discusses what they needed for a 911 services on campus. And we went from you know, being fully compliant on 911 but to this nomadic capability. So if your student or a, a faculty member is in on campus in a certain building on a certain floor, we know down to what access point or what switch they're using, their exact location. But we're also gonna tie that into your incident response so they know how to get to that person. You'll see some very cool things next week as we take that to the next level with Zoom rooms with things around wayfinding and, and dashboards to take it to the next level. So really exciting for it. That's great. Um, I, I, I am excited to hear all the new releases that we're going to be coming out with next week. Um, it's, it's hard for me not to be able to tell everybody right now. So, um, Tane, um, before we go to Sarah, let her catch her breath. Um, and um, can you um, share with us as best you can? Um, I know you have been out um, and sometimes I've joined you in a lot of discussions with our customers all throughout the country, uh, globally, actually. And what are some of the student engagement um, uh, enhancements do you, do you see coming or, or have we just recently released that you think are, are really um, useful and, and, and for student engagement? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Anne. So <clears throat> a little bit behind that too, right? I, I think, you know, we have this new paradigm with a lot of opportunities to innovate. You know, I don't like to use the term, term new normal. I think that has negative connotations, but I think this new paradigm allows us to really look forward, right? Um, but at the same time, I think we learn a lot. And you know, we've learned from a lot of places, especially like exec ed programs, who've had some real ground up models to follow around the idea of engagement, right? They're built for it. Uh, they really look at inclusion. Um, we want to look at quality and we want to find ways to kind of mix up the experience. It's sort of a balance between creating the novel, but making sure that we're stable as well, right? And how do we follow along with that? And so we really want to focus on building collaboration, uh, the idea of persistence. Uh, making sure that we can empower teachers and educators to do what they need and give them a certain level of choice. And we also want to think across disciplines, right? We want to advocate for those needs of the technology. We want to look at everything from science to math to music education to telehealth. Um, so a lot of really interesting things that we're looking at um, and a lot of things uh, that will be rolling out in the near future. So one that I think is fantastic, and um, this was actually talked about a little bit before, is our high fidelity audio mode. Uh, it's a very special mode we are able to add on by using the codec that Zoom has right now that is specifically for live performance. It basically strips away all the fancy stuff that um, kind of moderates your voice 
Uh, it bumps up the bit rate, uh, just puts it way up there. And so you can actually have somebody teaching piano lessons remotely. And the sound is just going to be absolutely high quality spot on. Super excited about that. Very engaging. I think um, one of the other ones is the uh, self-select for breakout rooms too, right? That, that was uh, something mm -hmm. we heard a lot about and people were very excited to, to get. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that was my next step. I mean, because the engagement happens in breakouts, right? Engagement is other people. And so now you can name breakout rooms, give them a subject, and you can tell people go seek out what you want to seek. And when you're done, you can move to another breakout room. So it really turns it more into a real live environment. And we are going to be doing work to double down on breakout rooms as well down the roadmap. So some really cool things are going to be coming out in the next month. Um, lots of customization. Uh, the idea to multi-pin people for yourself and to spotlight multiple individuals uh, for your classroom really just ramps up the engagement as well as accessibility. And you can also move people around in that gallery view. That's great for seeing you guys around as you've been talking. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you can move them around. You can have fun. You can change the Brady Bunch view. And that can actually be used for games. You can put people in certain areas. You can have different colors. You can arrange them. So you can really kind of think beyond the actual feature itself and have some fun with that. Um, PowerPoint is the virtual background is a fantastic feature. Uh, it's really a piece of human computer interaction where you can actually be in that weather person view over the PowerPoint that you're showing. So a lot of great opportunity there, especially if you want to mix a video into your PowerPoint, you can really layer your multimedia there, do a lot to keep people engaged. Uh, we're going to be improving nonverbal feedback, the hand raising, uh, the ways that uh, students and instructors can speak with one another and help instructors really read the room. Um, and then, you know, filters. I know some educators don't like them and they're very glad that we put in the uh, opportunity to turn them off. But at the same time, uh, if you deploy them properly, you can really have some fun. I think especially in the K through 12 area. Uh, and then again, down the roadmap, we're looking at assessment, we're looking at far more breakout features, and we're gonna be doing some great things with rooms as well, uh, specifically to breakout. So a lot of good engagement happening there. Thank you, that's great. Sarah, are you ready? Yes, thank you all so very much. And I think this is a perfect example. This is a perfect example of student engagement right here, live, real time. They just cut the power in my neighborhood. Lovely neighborhood. I love our beautiful lakeside view. So, you know, I'm not even one of those that you would maybe first judge and say she's going to have an issue with technology today. But here we go. So I think number one student engagement is to find a way like find a way, right, and, and extend that invitation to students in multiple modalities and differentiate, right? For me today, that was try the iPad, try the phone, <laughs> try, 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 right? Um, for students, you want to really be thinking about how can Zoom help them really get into an individual personal connection with the content, the context the learning objectives, the learning outcomes, right? And Zoom can do a really good job. We were talking recently about like the feature of rename. You think, oh, just make sure they have their first and last name. It looks professional. And that's true. But what if you're doing what we're doing at the University of Mississippi School of Pharmacy and you're teaching hypertension and you've got 200 drugs on your drug list that the students have to memorize? Maybe for this day, you say to them, rename yourself as the drug that is going to be the one that you're going to focus on. And you're going to find out every would work, won't work, maybe what could work, should never use because you're going to really drill down on that one. You're going to claim that you're going to own that. And that way it becomes personal. So student engagement means taking a look at all of the tools, even the tools that you think, oh, that's not for learning. Make it for learning. Find out how you want to look see and feel engagement in your Zoom environment and, and push it a little bit. See what other people are doing. Talk to the students, see what they need you to be doing, right? Take a look at those reactions. Look at the nonverbals. When you run a poll, maybe you find a way to see how well they're getting that in a different way with those reactions, not just with the answer, right? Really get a better gauge. And then calling students to then present, calling students in to explain, calling them to defend and challenge. Yeah, there's no hiding, right? <laughs> you can actually, right. So um, let's turn a little bit to the faculty. Um, you know, faculty engagement, faculty, faculty experience. Um, you, um, both of your schools, I mean, I think every institution, you know, had this huge um, move that they had to do. I mean, we, we've been doing online learning for decades, right? And all of a sudden it was in mass going online. So, um, Rusty, I'm, uh, or what have you done differently, um, and, and how, how was that experience, and where did Zoom help you in, in, in getting the faculty ready to, do, to be in a total virtual environment? 
Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. <coughs> Excuse me. So knowing, you know, knowing a college education certainly has a significant impact on social mobility and our institution has distinctions for affordability and flexible access. What do you, excuse me, <coughs> I might need you to shift to somebody else for a question real quick and uh, okay. come back because I get a drink of water. Okay, that's fine. Uh, yeah. Sarah, do you want to talk about, so you're an instructional designer, Yes, right? absolutely. This is my group. So I, I, I hear Rusty thinking as well about, okay, how do we approach this? Because we do faculty training luncheons and we sit down and we eat and we hear a guest speaker. Well, that's not going to happen in COVID-19, right? And you know what? That didn't necessarily need to really be happening because the same people kept coming, the same 20 people, when there's a 1,000 faculty, right? And so you know what? We've actually seen an increase in engagement on faculty's point. We've seen an increase in attendance. We hosted a all Zoom, all training for the entire University of Mississippi and we had 254 people attend that training. We've never had to, we don't even have a space for 254 people, okay? <laughs> so that is right. huge, plus people are watching those recordings. Customize, that's what you need to think of. Customize, find out who's needing to learn what piece it. If this person needs to learn screen share, do a specific session with another faculty. Faculty, faculty is where it's at. Maybe students can train, maybe you have some phenomenal Zoom experts as students. Maybe you need to do a small group for a department. Maybe it's just a unit and then track it. Okay, we did the screen share thing. How well are they doing on maybe breakout rooms? Can they handle that yet? You really need to customize. And I learned that at Zoomtopia, little plug. There you go, that's great. So Rusty, you're back with us. Okay. Tell us how yeah, you've been thanks. using sure. Zoom to engage with the faculty. Yeah, so, so we have a comprehensive program focused on student success. I um, mean, the faculty are a big part of that. And they use attendance data, for example, to help keep students engaged in the course to persist. So, you know, back in the on-campus days, you know, we had an in-class attendance system developed on a Raspberry Pi platform. So when we went to all online in spring, faculty did not have access to that data, which is really important for them to stay engaged with the, you know, with the students. So this summer, we developed a course collaboration tool to make it easy for faculty for, to do two things. One is create a Zoom meetings based on their class schedule and the student information system. One click, um, all the Zoom meetings with preferred settings uh, are scheduled. And it also creates a Microsoft Teams site and a shared cloud storage uh, drive. So by doing this, we can now associate a Zoom meeting with a class meeting and thus provide attendance data and dwell time to, to faculty. And so the course collaboration tool also supports uh, the scheduling of the Zoom meetings in our 80 classrooms equipped with Zoom rooms for hybrid flexible courses and lecture capture. So the Zoom room is integrated with our classroom control system. Faculty you know, can start a meeting with just one touch on the, you know, on the touch panel. Um, so making it easier for faculty to utilize the technology, one touch, my meeting has started, students are there, um, I'm teaching in the traditional method or you know, maybe slightly modified in order to support the online students as well. The Zoom meet meetings are automatically scheduled. I'm getting attendance data of in-person and online and I can really use that to keep them, the students engaged and on track to persist um, to be successful in the class. That's great. Mark, uh, do you have some other examples of where you um, see faculty really engaging with Zoom rooms? Uh, are there favorites that they like to do, you know, use? Or what, what, are, what are some of the things that you see that are most common? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different ways that I've seen now with the, the way they engage. But, um, you know, one of the things that we're seeing is it's spilling into the faculty meetings with, you know, each other, them talking to each other from classroom to classroom. We're seeing that. We're seeing... Uh, different ways that they're sharing their ideas and how they're reaching the students from home, right? I think like, for example, at the beginning, we, we saw use cases where um, the faculty were all in the same room. How are we gonna, they simulated the classrooms together with these devices. So um, a, a lot of good use cases there that came out of it and a lot of testing that went into this before we even got to the, uh, the actual classrooms themselves. So the, uh, the amount of communication that happened prior to opening up the first class was quite amazing to see it just across the board. Right, is, is the way that they would come up with these ideas to communicate. So, um, and, and a lot of feature requests came out of that, right? Tane, we've talked about this a lot. It's going to spill into Zoom rooms, 
right? That we're seeing that like today we, we have limited abilities to do breakouts in Zoom rooms. However, there's gonna be a lot more to come there. So um, thanks you know, to all the EDU space for helping us make the product a whole lot better in the Zoom room. So uh, Colby, do you um, see um, you know, faculty um, not only engaged within the class, but outside the class, right? And, and just like in the, um, the example that Rusty gave about like just you know, wraparound services and student success, how so that's really important. So the use of Zoom phone and having that sort of that number is them not having to give out their cell phone number seems to be a really popular use of it. What what are you seeing? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there there is the traditional ones of call queues and and support queues that are set up for real support services that we can help. But from a personal side for faculty, we've seen that that desire that I want to communicate with anybody on the means that they're used to. So, you know, in our personal life, we may be used to sending text messages and giving out numbers to those that we're closest to. But when I'm in an educational setting and I'm teaching students, I may not want them to have my personal cell phone number. I may not want to be receiving phone calls at 10 o'clock at night um, or on a Saturday and I'm trying to spend some time with the family. Um, and if there are messages sent, um, are they appropriate? Um, how are those tracked? Am I able to provide the right services? And so with Zoom phone, we give the couple abilities there that, that help there. One is setting up business hours. So, you know, between nine and five, I'm gonna take calls. After five, it's gonna go right to voicemail. It's gonna transcribe that voicemail, either send that in my client that I can read or send me an email, as well as, um, you know, just being able to put controls around there. So I know who's doing what and I can report on those back and forth. And then just being able to now provide uh, a number, so your caller ID that's given out. So instead of giving out, hey, here's my cell phone number, I'm gonna call out based on the main number of the university or the main number of the school I'm teaching at so that I am not giving out my personal phone number. So a lot of capabilities in Zoom phone that make it really seamless and easy to protect your privacy, but also increase your work-life balance. Yeah, I think Rusty too, uh, one of the things you said is you, you collect a lot of data, right? And certainly um, in this sort of new world of, of blended online learning, you know, just having that data of how um, we are interacting with the students, whether it's in the class, outside the class, you, you get that consistent data, whether it's in a meeting, it's in a chat, it's phone, Zoom rooms, it just gives you a lot of um, information, right? Um, do you see that value in that? Yeah, absolutely, right? I mean, data, you know, leads to insights, right? Insights leads to the ability to improve, you know, what you're, you know, what you're offering and the support that you can deliver, especially to faculty as well as students. So, you know, being able to collect that data is really important and be able to act on it. Yeah. Let's uh, shift a little bit. We have about um, six more minutes and then we'll talk a little bit. Um, we'll take some of the questions. We're getting some great questions. Um, Sarah, um, Lessons learned. I mean, you have worked, um, you know, with, in course design, course redesign. You're working across two campuses. Uh, you know, what what um, what words of wisdom do you have about using Zoom? Are some concrete examples? You already gave us a few, but what what other ways are you using Zoom to really um, engage throughout the the these two campuses and uh, and throughout your school of pharmacy? That is such a great question. I love that you talked about data, by the way. I just want to piggyback on that with formative assessments, thinking about polls and using them as formative assessments so that you change in real time what you're doing as you're teaching while you're teaching it, right? Use chat for students to tell you how to redirect, how to focus on those muddiest points. Okay. Oh, active learning, active learning, active learning. Okay. And so what did we learn? When you go into Zoom, you need to begin with the end in mind, just like you do in a classroom, right? Begin with the end in mind. Think about long-term, what do I want to see? And hopefully the internet has not gone out in her neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> Power, then internet, uh-oh. <laughs> yeah, the end in mind, though, that's, she hit the nail on the head there, right? I think... Um, right. That, you know, at least from the Zoom room perspective, I've, I've, it's been a joy to see a lot of these schools come together and build these things out with the end in mind. And I think they're seeing the long road ahead. So, um, you know, I, I see where she's going with it, but it's great stuff. Yeah, I, you know, you see a lot of, um, we, we're getting a lot of uh, pictures our customers are sending us of these 
huge, you know, monitors where they're bringing in the, the students right into the classroom and, you know, and having, making you feel like you're there and, that, and learning how to, to, to do that. It, it's fantastic. The other thing I think, um, Rusty, is, it, you know, we, we've been talking about uh, moving, you know, we, everybody had to go home. And um, so we opened the doors and everybody went out, but the doors are still open, right? So as students come back, you can bring the rest of the world into the classroom. And that is amazing. So how are, have you thought about that or how are you um, increasing that capability? I know one of the things Sarah talked about earlier is that they had the same 20 people coming, but now they have you know, much more participation. How's that affecting your campus and the way you guys think about? Yeah, I think of you know, two things. One is, you know, I hear from faculty that you know, they're, they're, they're much more open to bringing in the guest lecturer because it's easy to do um, you know, with the technology at hand. Um, and they're, you know, they're, they're getting more of the guest lecturers willing to accept because they don't have to travel to campus, you know, to, to participate. And, and the second is, you know, we, we have a really growing cybersecurity program. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, we have an adult audience that's coming from, you know, coming out of the military. So, you know, being a big, big military town, so we have students that have come in, they don't necessarily fit or are comfortable sitting in the classroom when they're in their 30s. And the students around them are in the 18 to 22 year old. And we have heard from faculty say those students will switch to online in the synchronous mode and become much more active and engaged in the class and the discussion than they would be sitting around the 18 to 22 year olds. So I, I think these kind of you know, technologies bring you know, great opportunity um, to really in, you know, increase engagement in the class. Yeah. Payne, I was just thinking um, perhaps you could talk a little bit about talk, um, when we think about access, right? Um, what are some of the things that we're doing around accessibility and live transcriptions and, you know, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, again, when we look at accessibility and we have a few different uh, things that we've done and we have a few different things that are coming. So, I've mentioned previously this ability to pin and spotlight multiple individuals. For those who don't know, pin is something you do for yourself, spotlight is something you do for everybody else. So you have the ability to pin up to nine people. So I want to see um, the instructor, I want to see an ASL interpreter, I want to see three other students for whatever reason to communicate, I can do that. If I'm the instructor and I want to show those individuals to my class, I can do the same thing. With that customized gallery view, it's the exact same thing. I can order individuals in the way that I would like. I can then push that view out to students so they see the exact same thing that I'm seeing. It's a great way to be able to reference what's happening. Live transcription, that's something that Zoom is rolling out right now. Uh, it's currently available to all of K through 12. As we spool up our capability, it takes a lot of work and a lot of energy. Uh, we'll be rolling this out as well. We're hoping for the end of the calendar year for higher ed. So please be patient, it is definitely coming. We think this live transcription is gonna be a very powerful uh, feature. We're really looking forward to getting this in the hands of our users. That's great, thanks. Uh so we have a question, um, a couple questions from the audience. Um, I think I'll weave into our discussion. And um, I, uh, uh, Sarah and Rusty, you probably have some good advice on this. Um, we hear from um, uh, Chris who's saying, I'm at a college. Um, sometimes students don't want to turn on their web camera. I was just curious from the Zoom perspective, why do you think this, why do you think this is the case? And I really think from Sarah and Rusty, what, why do you think that's the case? Well, I think I'll some, jump know, some, in there and, and start. Oh, so Rusty, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead, Sarah. Yeah, I'll jump in. Just students have a lot of curious, difficult, interesting uh, situations where they are. They some of them, many of them, are displaced. So if I'm a student who's being quarantined and I'm living in my aunt's garage, I'm not really excited and interested in showing my video. Uh, if, if I'm in the situation I'm in right now, I'm not showing my video just because I'm hoping to power up my audio. So I think compassion and empathy is really where it's at and requirements, not so much. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. good. And Russ, what would you say? Yeah, I was gonna say this, you know, the, the same thing, right? That I, I participated in some meetings where you know, the, the, the setting and the environment really weren't conducive for that person that had their video on. Um, mm -hmm. So that could be you know, the, you know, the challenge you know, for, for some of them you know, uh, as well. And, and we know it's easy to, to get distracted um, and so, you know, sometimes turning your video off, you know, doesn't let people know that you're distracted in that, you know, in that class. So, you know, the, the constant engagement 
whether it be verbal, nonverbal type of, you know, feedback, polling, gestures, those types of things are really, you know, key. And hopefully then they'll, you know, be comfortable to turn in, you know, on that video and participate. Yeah, sometimes you just, I know for me, even as a speaker, I don't want to look down at my notes and look like I'm looking down at my notes. And, right. but yet, you know, just having that sort of right on camera is difficult. And, and it, you know, maybe that person um, already had a lot of classes that particular day. Uh, let's see. So this one is for you, Mark. Um, what are the blended technology options to use with Zoom that Mark talked about? How do we learn about the expanded use of Whiteboard? Great question. So we have two hardware partners out there in our ecosystem that build great whiteboards. One is D10. Um, they have a blend of 55 and 75 inch uh, white ball and one whiteboards. And the other is Neat. Neat has a 70, uh, 65 inch uh, smart board out there. The cool thing about this is with these, we have a lot of innovation moving forward, right? So these are two partners of ours that have um, been on the journey to create Zoom rooms. Um, they have embedded Zoom into them. So you don't have to take any computer, any PCs on the outside and, and put a bunch of cables together. So these whiteboards are very, very easy to set up. Um, highly recommend them because you just take them out of the box, give them power, ethernet, or, or they can go wireless. And they usually come with a stand. So you can put them right up at a stand um, or you can mount them on the wall, but super, super easy to use. We've also seen these being used, blended classrooms at a 45 degree angle. I bring that up because on one of the use cases where we're talking to some of the instructors, and they simulated the room. A lot of times the, the students remotely or the instructor saw firsthand that they wanted to be able to see the instructor and the class and feel like they're in the room. So these types of devices have done a really good job of doing that, especially in the blended environment. So another question is, um, when is a good, um, how do you know when to use Zoom meetings or Zoom webinar? Sarah, do you wanna take that one? Yes, actually, we use webinars for FERPA protected tutoring because you have the Q&A and you don't have participants seeing who is there. Wonderful use of that, even though we didn't have a, a high number. But if you have over your number of people who are going to be participating, of course, that's an ideal time as well to use a webinar. You have 500 people who are going to be attending potentially all classes, you know, for the School of Pharmacy would, would be more than our maximum, you know, our, our limit. For a meeting so webinar is the way to go yeah. rusty how are you differentiating between using the two yeah I, th I think that you know also what is the intent of the meeting um you know if you're going to have few participants to be able to um, have video and audio um, then you know webinar is a, is a great way to go especially if you're trying to scale to you know large numbers but if you really want to have some type of you know true interaction uh, Zoom meeting is, you know, still with the audio and the video is a great way. It can become unmanageable if it gets too large. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I, I think it's, you know, really about the size, you know, as, as well as, you know, what the level of interaction, you know, you want and need, um, you know, using the tools. We, we use both. Um, another question is for security. How, how, what have you done differently um, as a CIO um, to secure uh, the use of Zoom across campus? Well, you know, we, we try to, you know, set a lot of default settings on the back end, you know, so when meetings are created, they automatically carry those settings, you know, for we really work hard on letting people understand and know that, that you know, the, the settings are comprehensive, so they're long. And, you know, when people set, you know, set up those meetings, sometimes you can get in trouble by, you know, uh, changing the, the settings. So we try to really make sure people understand, you know, when it comes to just, courses and information just for ODU faculty, staff, and students. We encourage, you know, authenticated, you know, in, into our domain as, yeah. you know, as the best way to secure. I mean, certainly all the default settings that Zoom has now implemented about requiring a password, you know, those types of things are, you know, important, you know, to secure the meeting. So it's, been, it's definitely been a journey for us. Um, you know, we, we have, you know, been successful um, you know, up, you know, up to this point. So we do appreciate all the, you know, new features and settings that Zoom has, you know, implemented over, over the past uh, six months. That's great. Um, yeah, it's really important. We, um, you know, uh, I, uh, 
was quoted as saying it was sort of some of the Zoom bombing is still like, you know, letting the uh, the streaker into the, uh, the into the lunchroom. Uh, we're still seeing a lot of pranks going on, and, you know, just in how people are using their names and they're getting like they're getting blocked because they're doing offensive things with their names. And so some of that is, you know, controlling student behavior, uh, even though it's uh, might be comical, it could be offensive to others. And so that's a that's important sort of practice right to to get um to let students know about tane um there is a question about could you talk a little bit more about the weather person mode and and how you know, where that um it is it's out right now um someone asked is you know what what's the timing of that release you want to talk about it yeah absolutely uh that is out now it is actually uh able to be used uh and one would use it from their uh, sharing menu, actually. So if you have the most recent, uh, most recent version of Zoom, you can actually share your screen. Uh, and what you would do is you go to your advanced tab and you'll see slides is virtual background beta. Uh, once you click on that, it will allow you to browse to a PowerPoint. It will load those PowerPoint slides in and it will set those slides as your virtual background. And you're actually able to use small handles to drag yourself uh, to make yourself larger and smaller, you're within a bounding box. You should do a little bit of testing. If it's mirrored, it can be a little bit strange when you're pointing at something, but uh, you can do that right now in the most recent version of the client. It's really worth checking out. It's a really cool feature. What I like about it too is that you can minimize yourself or you can make yourself big. Mm -hmm. You can go small. You can put yourself in different parts of the presentation. Yes, Sarah, do you have, I'm sure you have fun with that. I see your, the heart. <laughs> oh, I just can't wait. I had, I had no idea. I just can't wait. I'm already thinking of like three or four professors who tonight I'm going to be texting to say, are you ready to try this? Yeah. Good. Dive in and go. It's fun. Yeah, so it's really important. Zoom um, puts out, um, you know, we often um, uh, talk about some of our enhancements in our blogs, you know, on our website, we go to the resources. There's all kinds of videos. Um, through social media, we're doing all kinds of pro tips out there to just really push out how to use some of these latest and greatest ones. And Colby, do you want to show a fun one that you were fooling around with earlier today? Oh boy, you're going to call me out on it, right? I so. am. I am. Just to have a little bit fun. Well, you know, I was, I was trying to plan. We're coming up to Movember. Uh, every year I try and I fail really bad. So, you know, we have these new filters. So I got to, you know, decide, you know, what, how am I going to grow this out? Uh, is it a darker shade, a lighter shade? Maybe, uh, maybe skip that. So yeah, just a lot of fun that, that's, you know, you don't need Snapchat, but uh, we add, we add those features in there and, and that's in the latest beta as well. One of the things I like is that so many of us, the lighting is not good. You know, it depends on the time of day or where you are. And if you go down to the, um, the uh, stop video and there's that little arrow that goes up, uh, you can adjust your, your lighting. You can adjust, it has that glamor feature, which I always love and it's like, and, and you can adjust your audio. Uh, earlier today, I said to him, it's trash day. Can you hear the noise outside? And everybody said no. And it's cause I, I turned up the, uh, the, the sound um, on, uh, um, a reduction and so it really helps with like some of those you know we talked about earlier not everybody is in an ideal situation you might be sitting in your car and you know to get wi-fi outside of starbucks or someplace and so we're trying to put all kinds of features in that allow you to adjust to wherever you are 